Dr. Robin Kelly has a patient load as big as any other GPs, but out of his North Shore consulting room, he's a big thinker and prolific writer, and a musician too. Two of his books, The Human Antenna and The Human Hologram, have won awards from USA Book News. Robin contends that we humans are far more than biological machines, and that new thinking and science and spirituality is propelling us towards a fascinating future of enormous potential. But are we really holograms? He's in the hot seat to explain. Hi, Robin. Welcome to Let's Hi, Talk. Now, your book, The Human Hologram, was one, it's been one of the most um, challenging, I have to say, <laughs> books uh, that I've read in the course of researching for yes. this show this year. Because this is big. This is a massive topic, isn't it? Yes. And so, but let's begin with the title, um, The Human Hologram. What do you mean by that? Well, that's a very good question. Yes. That's why I, I know you've an old book, but can, <laughs> can you in a few sentences? Well, in fact, interesting, um, uh, about three years ago, new scientists uh, had their lead article, uh, you, are a hum you are a hologram. Um, and so the popular scientific press uh, has been toying with this mm. concept. Uh, and there are some uh, scientists around the world who feel that this... Um, that we see around us is the illusion mm -hmm. and that behind it all uh, there are just fields of information and that it is our senses that convert this reality into this time and space. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it is know. fairly big, isn't yes. it? Um, and uh, so I really took the, the premise that if this is the case, what does that mean to us, the human condition? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and is this too much information? Is this just going to make us flaky, weird, yes. spaced out? Is life literally? not complicated enough already? In this? Yeah. yeah. Do we need to know this? Mm. Um, and uh, if, in fact, uh, it is some semblance of truth in this, how is it going to help us? I'm a doctor. I'm a family doctor. Um, in helping us in our lives, what does it mean to living and dying? Mm. And so, um, and I also sort of searched out the more, I suppose, more formal science that is actually extending into quantum uh, uh, mechanics and how that, in fact, is part uh, of the of the living condition. Mm. Right. And and ten years ago, one would say the quantum world lived in the cold, hard. Uh, atmosphere of a laboratory uh, mm. and physicists, but actually that's changed. But even in fact, the, the quantum even, world yeah. has, is now being shown to exist in uh, in, in, in living being, living beings, and and also in uh, processes like photosynthesis and how we smell and and uh, the eyes of migrating birds. In fact, wherever they're looking, they're finding evidence of quantum processes, which are basically connections with um, an unknown uh, source, yeah. if you like. Can, can you define that quantum word? It's, yeah. a, it's a word we hear all the time these days, and a lot and, of us. And, are very, and a lot of people get yeah. into a lot of trouble with it. Yeah. And I know that a lot of scientists think that it's being misused. Mm. Um, it's quantum this, quantum that. Sells, sells, books, sells f films. Quantum of solace. Um, and quantum is just a package, a package of energy. So it doesn't really mean that much. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to um, I suppose a, the living being, um, it's describing uh, the fact that uh, certain part, the basic parts of our being, which are, we go beyond atoms into our electrons, in fact, uh, are actually appearing uh, out of an, a field of endless possibilities. Mm. Because, in other words, they're coming out of nowhere, as far as we would say nowhere our physical nowhere. Yeah, so that, in fact, that, what it's saying is that there are, our physical reality is actually based uh, on another, uh, another reality that we can't touch, but we can actually uh, beginning to understand. I can remember uh, being blown away the first time I sort of really started thinking about this, and I read in a book years ago now, that this table mm. in fact, isn't solid. Mm. This is not a solid thing. And yet, uh, you know, bang, bang, crash, crash, heavy. It's actually a mass of whirling atoms with space mm. in between the atoms. Mm. And I tried to tell somebody that once, and they said, what do you mean it's not solid? Look, yes, crash, it's crash. pretty solid yes. to me, yes. And so, it's, and so are, are our bodies just a mass of whirling atoms with space well, in between as well? And, you know, you well, we know they think, are. Yes. We know they mm. are. But mm. what does this mean? And in fact, you know, are we just sort of 
interfering patterns of fields and talking to each other. I mean, and, and puts, there is a puts, thought. It puts yeah. the thought of ghosts and things in a whole different light too, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. But also, you know, is it our senses that actually our eyes, our, our hearing and our touch that are actually converting this into mm. the reality we know? And these are the, these are the fields of consciousness. It's the consciousness studies that are actually being, um, well, being investigated around the world mm. in places like Arizona and, and, and particularly um, in Russia and, and other places. They're mm. saying, no, this, if you extrapolate the science <laughs> to this degree, yes, this, mm. this actually begins to make sense. But I'm asking, well, well, if it makes sense, you know, why are we here in this form in the first place? You know, then, well, course, why aren't we just floating around the spirituality like spirituality and yes. God and the universe and what we're all here for? I mean, Absolutely. it can do your head in, can't it? Yeah. And oddly enough, it's what people ask me as yes. well. You as, know, as, a, as a GP. As yeah. a GP, yeah, mm. okay. And they get it. Mm. But they also want to know, well, what's, um, you know, what's the deal with being physical? And why do I feel so sick? You know, yes. So, yes. so I'm trying to sort of put that into context yeah. as well. Um, there's some mention in your book of, of the concept of teleportation and mm. things, and mm. uh, you talk about something I had never heard of before <laughs> called water bears, a tiny, tiny little mm. microscopic creature that can survive anything from extreme heat to extreme cold. Yeah. And I gather they're thinking about doing that. But you mentioned again uh, a second ago too that, that Russia and what was the other country are doing well, interesting the, the, things? Well, uh, there's a there's a, an test called Stuart, mm. Professor Stuart Hammeroff, mm. and uh, uh, he, he is uh, in investigating this very process. Are, we, are our brains, in fact, uh, converting these other realities, yes. quantum realities, into this reality that we, we call well, consciousness? So then we get into the, uh, the other big argument of the times, really, about the people who say they have um, experiences after they die. And there's yes. one school of thought that says, brain shut down, <coughs> that's it, you know, That's it's right. just a chemical called chemical reaction. And the other sort who say, no, hang on, maybe your, you know, your brain is just the instrument that's transmitting everything to you and that everything still exists even if you don't anymore. Yes, they yes. say that consciousness uh, exists outside the brain mm. and others would say it's a creation of the brain mm. as well. And in fact, as a doctor, we're probably, if we did ever think about this, we'd be saying that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, it's a thing created by the brain. Whereas, um, I suppose this science is suggesting that consciousness is actually um, beyond the brain. And in fact, we are the converters. We are the downloaders of consciousness. Um, so how, how does this help you as a GP? If a patient comes to you, says they're ill, we find out in due course they have, say, leukemia, mm. how can this knowledge help you in treating that patient? Because I presume you're still using conventional, or recommending conventional yes. remedies, et cetera, et cetera. So well, does, does this belief system sit on top of all of that? In a well, one of the things I try and teach is how to, um, how to somehow uh, create a sense of peace. Uh, and at a sense of peace, then you're feeling well. Okay? So even though, though we're tired and we've got pain, how are we going to exist in the moment? How are we going to be as happy as we can be away from fears and away from, 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 from doubts? Um, and uh, in fact, the, the thoughts are that when we're in what we call in the zone or when we're totally relaxed, we're at peace with the world. We're actually at one with the world. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this fits in. We may be at one with the field of information. So by everybody who has a chronic illness, if they can get to the stage, then they escape um, the worries, the fears, and to a certain extent, the pain of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And it also may bring into question if they have a, a condition that's going to contribute to their life's ending, uh, a discussion about this, which people are wanting to do. They want and this, to is, this is comforting for people in that situation? Well, it's, it's comforting, um, but it's not patronizing, I mm -hmm. hope. It's yeah. actually- It's engaging, uh, really, It's engaging, it? yes. uh, and more and more people wanting to know this. Yeah. They're, they're actually mm -hmm. coming out with this. And it's also, it does create peace, and it reduces fear. Mm -hmm. Something I was intrigued by was a, a phrase that you put together, which is the timeless dimension of togetherness, yes. which means that, yes, there are connections between all of us, especially yes. people with whom we're close. Yes. And you hear stories about this in your yes. consulting room? Oh, absolutely. Can you, yeah. for instance, it? Well, I can, for instance, I mean, one of the things I explain is that if you love somebody or somebody's in your family, if they go to Alaska or the other side of the world, you don't love them any less. So you can say love is non-local mm. uh, and timeless and if they do in fact pass over you don't stop loving them mm. in fact you know that's what our grief is as well but also I've noticed many 
stories of particularly mothers and daughters, for instance, who have synchronous thoughts um, uh, and what we call telephone telepathy, mm. that you're, while you're thinking about your, your, your dear one or a friend or a dear friend, the phone rings. Um, and uh, I, from my observation and, and certain of the studies, it's the closeness of those relationships that actually uh, somehow promotes these, these uh, uh, spontaneous and, and synchronous acts. Mm. So the answer is yes, and that's something that exists outside time. You know, and if we, we were asked to, you know, did you, when, you, when did you have your, a good time? And you say, well, I had a great time last night. Um, it doesn't mean that you had a great time because it was five hours rather than four hours. Yeah. You can't actually, you had a great time because you forgot about time. You were, oh. you were sort of laughing. Okay, so it's the time that exists outside time um, that makes our life so exciting. That could be your next book, One on Time. Oh, exactly. This, this yeah. one's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.